Hello and welcome to this session on anaphylaxis in the community, supporting the patient. I'm delighted to be here uh, giving a talk to um, primary care, which is the foundation of managing uh, children and adults with allergies. I work at St Thomas's Hospital in my NHS practice and I work at the Portland Hospital uh, in my private practice. So I'm going to start off with what the, the lay public see uh, in terms of uh, allergic reactions to in particular nuts that can cause fatal reactions. So there are uh, unfortunately quite a few uh, of these episodes of children and adults who die after eating nuts in a meal that they did not know contained nuts, although they were aware of the fact that they had a nut allergy. And I always tell my patients who have a nut allergy that they should not have any takeaways from Indian or Chinese restaurants because there are often cases where the nuts are swapped for other types of nuts. For example, in this situation, uh, Paul Wilson died after they swapped the almond powder for a cheaper powder containing peanut in the meal. However, what I do want to stress is that although there are quite a lot of people who report food anaphylaxis, so self-reported food anaphylaxis is um, just over one in 10 people. Uh, however, those that actually get coded as food anaphylaxis are between one in 100 and one in 1,000. Those that get admitted to hospital for food anaphylaxis are closer to the one in 10,000. And those who die from fatal food anaphylaxis are between uh, one in 100,000 and one in a million. And that it's actually more common to uh, die because of death due to murder in the US than to die from fatal food anaphylaxis. So although anaphylaxis is not uncommon, death from anaphylaxis is very rare. And in terms of the patients that we're caring for, I think it is important to express that to them because then they can have what we call sort of a good way of doing risk assessments for themselves where they can lead a normal life uh, where they're not afraid of eating any food but that they're also careful in the way that they manage their food allergy. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is the different things that can or cannot predict whether an individual in front of you may have anaphylaxis. And I think this is really important because when I see patients in my clinic, often the question is how severe is my allergic reaction going to be or my child's allergic reaction? So the severity of a previous reaction is a risk factor for future anaphylaxis. However, more than 50% of fatal food anaphylaxis cases occurred in people who had only mild reactions. And this is predominantly in people who have a nut allergy, which is why I prescribe adrenaline auto injectors for all children that have nut allergies and adults. Most children with subsequent anaphylaxis have previously had a mild reaction. So if somebody comes and says, well, I've only ever had mild reactions, does that mean that I'm not going to have anaphylaxis in the future? Unfortunately, uh, we can't give them these guarantees. So what can we do to predict the severity of a food allergic reactions? Well, number one is nuts. So peanuts and tree nuts are the highest um, uh, cause of fatal food anaphylaxis. The second one is delayed or no administration of adrenaline. The third is upright posture during anaphylaxis. The fourth is having asthma, particularly poorly controlled asthma. The next is uh, food allergic individuals eating away from home or from takeaways. Then age, so particularly teenagers and young adults that potentially are carrying their adrenaline auto injectors around with them uh, and are potentially engaging in more risk-taking behaviors. In adults, this is more to do with sting and uh, drug allergy. So if they initially are told that they have a different food allergy or told they have no food allergy, then a misdiagnosis can increase the risk of an allergic reaction. And then there is a condition called systemic mastocytosis, which is very rare, where the individual has um, too many mast cells uh, due to overproduction of this, and this leads to more severe allergic reactions. So this is some recent data looking at fatal food anaphylaxis in the UK with 152 people who died. 
So it's uh, separated into children under 16 years of age and adults. And I think this is really important because it shows you the way that food allergies are developing. So as I mentioned, peanuts and tree nuts, which are um, peanut is purple, tree nut is yellow orange, and then an unidentified nut is in pink. You can see that for children, this is approximately a third of the deaths occur, occur due to nuts. In adults, it's almost it's uh, over half of adults that died of a nut allergy. What I want to stress is that in children, 26% of the deaths were due to milk, cow's milk. And this is much greater than in adults where it was only 5%. But what I would say is that looking at the milk allergy in my clinic, we are getting more and more children with persistent milk allergy. And we now actually have a way to treat milk allergy with milk oral immunotherapy, which is now um, being done uh, routinely in my practice. And so there are ways to try and address this in a safe way. Thereafter, fish and crustacea are uh, between six and 7% in both children and adults. And then a surprising number are other or unknowns, where about a third, it's either other or they don't know why that individual had fatal food anaphylaxis in terms of which food. So uh, this I uh, wanted to highlight uh, Karambia Chima, uh, was a boy who died after he had cheese thrown at him uh, from a schoolmate. And the inquest um, shared a number of different things, but particularly about educating schools, teachers, pupils, and making allergy everybody's business, because the individual who threw the cheese had no idea that that could kill him. And um, in a, the review, they showed that cow's milk was responsible for 16 out, sorry, 17 out of 66 deaths in school-aged children from 1992 to 2018. I also want to mention Sesame. Um, so this is a very uh, amazing piece of work that Natasha Edman Laperouse's parents, Tanya and Nadim, have achieved. Uh, Natasha sadly died from eating a sandwich that she bought from Pret at the airport, which contained sesame seeds um, inside the flower of the wrap. And she unfortunately died um, whilst um, she was on the plane. And uh, her parents have done uh, the most amazing work in the name of Natasha to ensure that food that is prepared, prepacked for direct sale, such as in Pret, now has the full ingredients lists so that people can check what it is they're eating. And this has uh, been implemented now in the UK. So I want to go through some of the other things that you can discuss with your patients that are important in terms of uh, the severity of reaction. So the first thing is dose of allergen and also whether it's concealed in a matrix, uh, particularly wheat, alcohol and spices. And then I'll go through the rest of these as we go through the presentation. So this is a study that would not get through ethics now. Uh, this was done in, uh, before 2010 in Australia. Uh, and they took children that had a peanut allergy and they gave them peanut. And even if they started reacting to peanut, they continued to give them peanut to see if they developed anaphylaxis. So 21 out of the 27 children that had a positive food challenge developed anaphylaxis. But the first three was with an initial symptom. And then the 13 thereafter were with subsequent peanut exposure. Which means that probably if you're allergic to peanut and you keep eating the peanut or you have a larger dose, you're more likely to have anaphylaxis. Contrary to this, um, fatal reactions have not been described in foods with precautionary allergy labeling. Just to discuss this in um, some detail, these are voluntary allergy labels that uh, industry, food industry producers put onto products. Uh, they've done some studies looking at what the language is and whether it means that there's more nut or more of the food allergen in that product. And it does not make any difference um, what it says. It all is a voluntary type of labelling. And there was a really good study done by the Food Standards Agency in the UK looking at products that said they may contain traces of peanut and 0.5% of these products actually contained 
detectable amounts of peanut. The next point is the specific IgE immunological response and other parts of the immune system. So can this predict whether the child is going to have a severe allergic reaction? So there is contradictory evidence that sensitization by skin prick testing or specific IgE, commonly known as RAS testing, is predictive of severity. And the reason for this is that children with very low skin prick tests and very low specific IgE results can also have anaphylaxis. So you have uh, life-threatening reactions occurring at all levels of sensitization. So what I tell my patients in clinic is that the size of the skin prick test does not predict the severity of reaction, it predicts the likelihood of reaction. Next, we're going to talk about allergic disease burden. So asthma, rhinitis, eczema, and mastocytosis are all interlinked with food allergy as per the food allergen uh, march or the atopic march. So in particular, we know that uh, asthma and food allergy are closely related. So food allergy does cause respiratory symptoms in many children. 50% of food allergic children have allergic reactions involving respiratory symptoms, whether that's upper or lower airways. And 40% of food allergic reactions have a respiratory component. We also know that certain foods, particularly fish, but also egg, can be aerosolized and can cause allergic reactions purely by breathing them in. Also, I have patients that when they go into certain coffee shops, they can breathe in the inhaled milk from the steaming and can have anaphylactic reactions due to that. So in terms of fatal or near fatal anaphylactic food reactions, one of the things that is very important to note is whether they have asthma or not. So these are various studies that looked at individuals that had fatal or near, near fatal anaphylactic food reactions and whether they had asthma in the orange column or whether they did not have asthma in the blue column. And you can see here that the majority of individuals had asthma, which is why if a child has a food allergy and also has asthma, that is an absolute requirement for adrenaline autoinjectors. So as you can see, asthma and anaphylaxis are two sides of the same coin. Moving on to the next point. So there are various physiological factors, such as uh, being unwell, just doing exercise, um, alcohol consumption. I'm going to focus, however, on age, as I think that's something that's a very useful thing to know about. So age is a risk factor for fatal food anaphylaxis. This group did a review of the admissions for um, food uh, reactions and then the fatality rate so that you could see proportionally which age group were more likely to have a fatal reaction rather than just be admitted. So you can see that the top group were children between the ages of 10 and 14 but also those children at 5 to 9, 15 to 19 and between 35 and 39, surprisingly, had a high rate of fatality. We know that teenagers have increased risks of severe reactions, partly because they don't want to um, be different from their peers. They may sometimes hide the fact that they're having an allergic reaction. They may sometimes hide from their friends that they're allergic to foods. Uh, and or they may treat their uh, reaction and then not go to an uh, emergency. So there's lots of different reasons why teenagers are at higher risk of um, food anaphylactic fatalities. Finally, uh, as I mentioned, timely and effective treatment is very, very important in terms of whether you have a mild reaction or a severe reaction. You can see here that the, um, if you are able to timely uh, use your emergency treatment, you are more likely to have a mild reaction than if you wait. So this was a study which looked at the use of adrenaline autoinjectors by children and teenagers. And it's pretty shocking that 83% of teenagers that had anaphylaxis did not use their adrenaline autoinjector. And that is for a variety of reasons. Um, some of them are needle phobics. Some of them don't know how to use it. 
Some of them are, are worried about um, raising attention to themselves, but this is the first line treatment for anaphylaxis. And studies have shown that if you use your adrenaline autoinjector within five minutes of anaphylactic symptoms, your outcome is far better than if you wait for after five minutes. This was a larger European data set where they looked at 59 centers with over 3000 cases of anaphylaxis and only 13.7 of lay or self-treated reactions to foods were noted, whereas it was around 27.6% for insect anaphylaxis. And there were seven fatal reactions amongst this number of um, individuals. Finally, I want to talk about the importance of position and a lot of parents are not aware of this. So if a child has anaphylaxis, what's really important is that they are not made to be upright because they are much more likely to have a fall in their blood pressure, which will be harder to um, uh, resolve. So in the BSACI allergy action plans that I provide for all my patients, if they have uh, features which involve their consciousness, so if they're suddenly drowsy, if they're really dizzy, if they have collapsed, if they're baby, if they've become suddenly sleepy, they need to lie on their back with their legs raised. If, however, they have problems with airway or breathing, they can sit. Um, so that's a hoarse voice, difficulty swallowing, a persistent cough, wheezing or noisy, uh, difficulty breathing they can sit up, but they should not become upright. So when the ambulance arrives, parents should be told that they should stay lying down or sitting down and not get up to walk to the ambulance. So my take home messages are that anaphylaxis is not uncommon, but death from anaphylaxis is very rare. As I mentioned, it's less common than being murdered in the US. Um, in children, milk is a potential risk factor for fatal food anaphylaxis. 26% of children, um, of all children that died, were due to cow's milk. And this is really important because cow's milk is everywhere. And also um, there is immunotherapy available for cow's milk. Food specific IgE levels are of limited clinical value for predicting severity of reaction on food challenge. So as I mentioned before, I tell all my patients that the size of their skin prick test and their specific IgE or RAS test is not related to the severity of their reaction, but is related to the likelihood of their reaction. The diagram that I showed before was the Swiss cheese model of multiple um, risk factors for anaphylaxis. And we know that it's not usually just one thing that leads to um, the, the poor outcomes when it comes to anaphylaxis. There's the dose, so having a higher dose before you start reacting, um, and whether that's in a matrix, that can mean that you have delayed symptoms, whether the individual has asthma, particularly whether their asthma is poorly controlled. And when I see my patients, I'm always making sure that I screen for asthma and we can do tests like spirometry and exhaled nitric oxide to assess asthma. And I'm very uh, proactive in terms of managing their asthma because if they have poorly controlled asthma and they have a peanut allergy and then they eat the peanut, they're much more likely to have a severe anaphylactic reaction involving their lungs. In terms of age, I've mentioned that teenagers are a particularly high risk group. It's really important to engage the teenagers. I run a transition service in my NHS practice, trying to directly have a conversation with the teenagers and explain to them how the medicine works and why it's so important and exactly what to do when you go out with your friends to the restaurant, how to manage it, not to go into the toilet and hide uh, if you're having an allergic reaction, all of these different things. So adrenaline is the first line and gold standard for the management of anaphylaxis. Using it within five minutes has a good beneficial outcome. And then finally, position in terms of not getting upright after having been lying down or in a seated position. These are my contact details. And if you're interested in this topic, I did a podcast uh, with the HCA on uh, health fact versus fiction. Why am I allergic? And this is my website and also my contact details for the practice. Thanks so much for your attention and I'm happy to take some questions.